So good afternoon to all of you. It's wonderful to have you here. I am absolutely delighted to have the opportunity to announce the third and final Castle Lecture of 2019. So I realize you are all now familiar with the origin and the format, but I just want to say especially how grateful we are to John Castle for endowing these lectures in honor of his ancestor, one of Yale's founders, John Pierpont. It was Mr. Castle's intention to create a forum for exploring large topics and powerful ideas, and we are so delighted to have Justice Cuellar as a person who embodies that spirit. So by now you all know a fair amount about Justice Cuellar. You know that he serves as a justice on the Supreme Court of California. You know that he previously served as the Stanley Morrison Professor of Law at Stanford and in many roles in the Obama administration. I just want to say um, he is a beloved uh, a figure among our alumni and a much admired one. That doesn't really, is not really a fair thing to say, but as dean I want to claim him. He's a beloved and admired figure in the entire legal profession, so he belongs to all of us. I think part of what makes these lectures so compelling is the way that they allow us to keep returning to the same subject over time and to do it over a series of days rather than all at once. And since you've heard the first two lectures, I know you can appreciate the importance of the questions that he's raising today and why they require our sustained attention. I mean, there's a reason why we as pedagog pedagogical uh, masters try to space courses out over a full semester. We can tell you that any time you need, learn something, you need to return to it and rethink it and look at it from a different lens. And that's sort of the magic of these lectures and what makes them really distinctive and special. So it's my pleasure to reintroduce Professor Cuellar, whose own life I think is a testimony to the values of seeing this country from all of its many sides. His life has been defined, and I think his work has been powerfully informed by a perpetual change of perspective. He was born in Mexico. As a boy, he crossed the border five times a week to go to junior high in Brownsville, Texas. He would said at one point that this gave him the sense that he inhabited two worlds. And at 14, when his family moved to California, he entered a completely new school in the middle of his high school years. And of course, we all know he excelled there, enrolling as an undergraduate at Harvard becoming, before coming here to Yale Law School and then returning to California for his PhD. The ethos of working across boundaries, I think, has defined his career ever since. And I know you're thinking there's a really big boundary in his background, which is going from Harvard to Yale. Uh, we're delighted that he decided to come a little south um, and depart from that rather unknown place up north. But in all seriousness, I actually think that much of his career is about helping others to think about how to cross boundaries as well. His career has always tacked between practice and the academy. Even as a law student, he launched a nonprofit focused on teaching English, and he spent summers working to advocate for policy change, including the, re re the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. After his PhD, when he started teaching at Stanford, he took an active role in steering the university's engagement with a variety of broader causes. And here, too, he focused on the law across borders, creating Stanford Center for International Law, uh, International Security and Cooperation, and the Freeman Spogli Institute, which contains it. Now, what I like about Tino is that um, nothing, none of that work ever impeded him from becoming a great scholar and for producing two full-length books during that period. He then took a leave from Stanford to join President Obama's Domestic Policy Council, where he led efforts to reform our criminal justice system and our immigration system and to improve public health policy. He chaired a commission that highlighted the substantial failures of America's public education system and its failure to close the achievement gap and do justice by our country's children. And when I think of him in that role in particular, I think that it was a gift for all of us to have someone in that position who had seen America's schools from both sides of the border, who knew why a boy would make a pilgrimage every day to go to an American school, and just as importantly, what people couldn't or wouldn't do the same. And when I think of him on the bench, I think that actually the highest calling of the judge may be this capacity to see the law and the cases before him from many sides. Now we typically in law depict justice as someone who is blindfolded, but we all know that no judge is blindfolded. I think the really the true way to think of what you want from a judge and the best hope uh, for judging is that a judge's sympathies and vantage points are the broadest and most capacious in the room. And at the foundation of Justice Cuellar's record for service and excellence, those are the traits that make him an extraordinary academic, an extraordinary policymaker, and an extraordinary public servant. We are honored to call him a friend of this university and this school, and I am incredibly delighted to be here to introduce him for his third and final lecture. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Ms. Thank you.
<laughs> Thank you, Dean Gherkin. You're a terrific dean, a great friend. I'm so grateful. I would like to meet the person you just introduced. Uh, uh, I, I will tell you, you know, one of the greatest uh, gifts of this opportunity to come back to Yale has been uh, reconnecting with the time I spent here. I've been back several times before, but something about this trip has been different. Part of it is that I have a wonderful uh, schedule that's been put together by EP&E, but it gave me some time to walk around, to visit uh, Orange Street, where I used to live, and then to go to Canner Street, where I used to live, and then go down Whitney Avenue. And I reflect on that all the more because you gave me a beautiful gift just a few months ago when I wrote you out of the blue and asked to see if you might possibly have a copy of my uh, law school admissions essay. I must say, I was scared to write because I was scared that the answer would be yes, <laughs> in part. I thought that um, reading the words that one writes when one is uh, just about to graduate from college and uh, thinks that one has figured out the world is a very scary thing, but, um, but you did have a copy, uh, notwithstanding uh, any number of document retention policies that uh, normally make this very unlikely whenever lawyers are involved. And it was, um, it was refreshing to read it because in some ways I feel relieved that I have learned a lot. Um, but in other ways I feel like I'm still much the same person. And, and I hope we all can strike that balance in different ways. So um, I want to talk to you about a subject that will relate in both subtle and maybe more profound ways to the topics I've discussed in the previous lectures. In the first lecture I kind of started with a bit of the commencement speech I gave at Stanford University in 2017. And, um, underscored to you all that I felt challenged by how optimistic those words sounded. I uh, focused on in incredible improvements in living standards and education and clean water that we've all experienced uh, over the course of a hundred years, or most people have experienced in the world. And I wanted to bring back into the conversation the uh, climate change and nuclear uh, and inequity challenges that the world faces and to grapple with what that means for all of us. In the second lecture, I talked about how any of us who have served in government, as well as those of us who have had the privilege of stepping, stepping back and thinking about how we might do good in the world, uh, the challenges we face being honest with how complicated it is to answer the questions of what to do and how to do that. And I talked about how we might do better in that process. Today, I want to talk to you about a subject that I could maybe introduce uh, in different ways, but. Um, I'll just start with a, a brief little uh, anecdote about a conversation I had with my daughter. So uh, my daughter is in school and had to read Frankenstein. She was sharing with me how much she loved the book, how compelling it was, how complex she felt it was, how it uh, brought to the fore some ideas about the uh, changing nature of the world and how the world deals with mystery. And I couldn't help myself. I, said, I, I, I played out in my mind a conversation I wanted to have with her. I said I wanted to tell her, some of what you find interesting about Frankenstein is what I find interesting about the continuing fascination the world is beginning to have with artificial intelligence and how we have this pull towards it because of a sense of wonder and its possibilities to solve problems but some dread and fear about it as well and isn't that interesting that you can probably discern that in Frankenstein that sense of uh, wonder and possibility at science but also the fear and the possibility of unexpected consequences. So I broached the subject with my daughter and I said, you know, it reminds me of, don't say anything more. You're going to tell me that this is all about artificial intelligence. And I thought to myself, I'm going to ask her, am I that predictable? And she said, and yes, you are that predictable. <laughs> so I would like to just hug the problem, as it were. Um, big picture first. Uh, as a Silicon Valley person, I share with you a country that has been transformed to some degree by not just <coughs> the uh, infrastructure of the internet that was becoming commercially available right around the time that I was graduating from college, but by the framework of technology and knowledge and data and the infrastructure that does extraordinary things with that information that's gathered. So I would put it this way, I'd say our civilization's achievements include building an education system that makes education available on a massive scale, improving public health, building a legal system that can adjudicate even just in my own state millions of disputes a year, however slowly and imperfectly. But among all these things that we've done, one of the most extraordinary, I think, is the ability to um, build a physical infrastructure that can perform tasks that if they were performed by humans, we'd think they require intelligence. From pretty humble origins, 
rooted in the work of scholars like Alan Newell, John McCarthy, Herbert Simon, Ed Fagenbaum, and Barbara Gross, this field of AI, artificial intelligence, has been transformed um, by the rise of the internet, mostly because it's allowed this unprecedented gathering of data that is the raw material that this new technology, well, not entirely new technology, but this technology newly uses to do all kinds of interesting things when it's married up with also greatly expanded computing power. And I'll say more about that in a moment. A few days ago, an academic journal reported uh, on a survey experiment showing that automatically generated news stories, uh, evaluated blindly, were rated as more credible and less biased than human-generated ones. And there's a remarkable video you can get on the web from uh, an outfit in Silicon Valley working on getting closer to artificial general intelligence called OpenAI. And what they've done is they've used reinforcement learning to get one robot hand to solve a Rubik's Cube. Um, and it's a, it's a beautiful and eerie thing to see, to be honest, just the weird way that it moves. Humans can solve Rubik's Cubes uh, with two hands, uh, but it's awfully difficult. You could argue at the very edge of human ability to do it with one hand. Um, it's always possible, though, for reasons I'll explain, I think not likely, that humans' growing capacity to build intelligence into physical objects will plateau or even retreat. The two threats that I dwelt on in the first lecture uh, offer some reasons why, uh, nuclear climate, but secular declines in the enthusiasm for and perceived potential of AI are quite familiar in the field, so it's uh, not imprudent to think that the rate of change in the field will go up and down. What I think is striking is that even if development stops well short of any breakthrough that makes you know, cross-domain generalized AI loom anywhere near close, just if you take the technology we have right now, combining software instantiating AI architectures, the internet, norms that allow for more centralized data collection, this is all probably going to have massive effects beyond what we've seen in our lives. So let me give you just one example to chew on as I get started. So there's a graduating college senior who wants a job at a large company. Very familiar scenario, probably describes some of the undergrads who are here. Uh, but first she has to submit to a video interview on her very own smartphone through which her facial expressions, the positions of her eyes, uh, her gestures, her speech patterns are copiously analyzed by software. She's told to just be herself to avoid trying to game the algorithm judging her performance. And as she's interviewed, the algorithm works to assess the fit between the voluminous data garnered from the interview, all the like, details that she can't easily or even uh, at all control, with similar data from employees that fit the company's definition of successful. What that definition is, of course, is up to the company. It could be the genuineness of her warmth in dealing with a customer, the likelihood of her embrace of the company's culture of loyalty over a contentious version of Albert Hirschman's voice. A few days later, she learns that she's not getting the job. No one explains to her how the algorithm works, nor can she assess the validity of the predictions made. To think of this scenario as a science fiction prediction is, of course, wrong. Uh, eight days ago, the Washington Post wrote about the software and its extensive use in some companies. The software company's own CTO defended the product by emphasizing that, quote, people are rejected all the time because of how they look, and algorithms eliminate that in a way that hasn't been possible before. A scholar from NYU differed sharply, calling the case of the software uh, pseudoscience and a license to discriminate. And the people whose lives and opportunities are literally being shaped by these systems, of course, don't have any chance to weigh in. That's what she said. Now the software is the subject of a recent complaint before the Federal Trade Commission, and the software will almost certainly also inspire people to question in other fora whether cultural differences in facial expression, whether you spent some time in your childhood at a public school in another country, or your father's from Kenya and your mother's from Kansas, just to pick two random places, may be driving unacceptably disparate outcomes. Of course, humans are not only biased in both quite blunt and subtle ways, we're also prone to anger and jealousy, hunger, hangovers. That said, comparing software to human deliberation is complicated. Human decision makers must often explain themselves to a hiring committee or compliance officers. We know what it feels like to be forced to live with our decisions. We may need to explain them in court or at least to a compliance officer. Humans are capable of empathy with the people they're interviewing. We could ask how these realities weigh for or against the use of such software, but the cost-benefit calculus is a far cry from the salmonella contamination prevention egg safety rule that I discussed at the beginning of my talk yesterday. 
A candid conversation about such topics implicates deeper issues about the blurry line between reasonable behavior and cognitive error or bias among humans, about the role in our lives of machines that even the people who design them don't fully understand, about what determines responsibility between systems or networks of AI systems and us, about the scope of that conversation as our society changes and gets used to autonomous vehicles, or to systems coaxing our children to watch videos they seem powerless to resist, uh, Handling these questions right, I would argue, will depend on a mix of humility and attention to institutional realities of the kind that I mentioned in my talk yesterday. It will also require candor about the high stakes of the conversation about not only artificial judgment, but about human judgment. Why is it special for humans to make decisions? Why should we defend that? Should we? But more on this in a moment. In some ways, this technology, artificial intelligence, scaled up using the internet, is full of possibility for automatic translation and for personalized learning, for improved energy efficiency. The productivity of the health sector in particular hasn't grown in many years, but health employment and costs keep rising. AI's promise may be to starkly change that. But we'll also likely encounter some dark and difficult subjects. Weaponized AI, illicit uses, elite and mass disagreement about its proper role, dislocation of workers, and cultural conflict. Because the terrain gets more uneven and messier, it's probably worth approaching our deepening engagement with AI with some of the wisdom gleaned from our relationship to the problems I discussed in my first lecture, climate change and nuclear. The underlying technologies may be different, but the capacity of society to take a technology fertile with possibility to an illogical or at least dangerous extreme should be self-evident and is better taken seriously instead of being ignored. So the reflections that follow begin from that premise and also try to take seriously the difficulties of weighing consequences that I surveyed in the lecture yesterday. Uh, some of those difficulties are made all the more interesting because of course the technology is becoming more capable of shaping not only our physical environment but our preferences and values rather than just the details of our surroundings. I'll review some of the drivers of recent interest in AI and then consider some of the opportunities and risks. I'll make a very tentative case for the importance of human judgment, at least in consequential personal or social decision making, in a world that will increasingly want to rely on AI for routine decision making. Then I'll sketch out some broader themes that I hope will connect all three lectures a little bit. Okay, the changing path and development of AI. AI systems are used not only in hiring, but in pretrial risk assessment, they inform medical diagnoses, they power global networks of content and data that interact with billions of users and are increasingly at the core of global commerce. For anyone in my profession who rightly worries about access to justice for hundreds of millions of Americans and frankly billions around the world, it should be clear that properly designed AI systems have the potential to enhance access to justice through automated analysis of legal claims and provision of assistance, perhaps even in real time. Even just in California, millions of litigants who currently seek to navigate the court system without a lawyer flail and struggle and have difficulty. I would like them all to have a lawyer in person, but that's not likely to happen in my lifetime or in my kid's lifetime. And all of this may just be the beginning of far more fundamental transformations that can be affected by AI and impact, for good or not, millions of jobs and will engage lots and lots of people in new social arrangements, new kinds of relationships, new forms of entertainment. As many of you know, the cutting edge of work in advanced AI relies on artificial neural networks, somewhat loosely inspired on the architecture of the human brain. Uh, they deploy a panoply of layers and sometimes millions of variables to spot patterns. A few discernible trends to my mind are apparent in the work of the organizations that are most dedicated to advancing the cutting edge here, which I define by efforts that are credible to pursue generalized AI that can have a degree of intelligence that cuts across different contexts. Using techniques such as deep reinforcement learning, these AI systems are capable of increasingly complex behavior, even if it's daunting or worse to understand or explain exactly how they work. The one-handed robot I mentioned, less dexterous than a human, can now solve a Rubik's Cube using reinforcement learning. So millions of trials that are constantly updating and teaching the system how the world might be made to work better the way the system needs it to work so that it can solve 
the problem. Also worth observing, in addition to you know, the beating of humans in strategy games like Go or StarCraft, including the very best humans, is um, how uh, techniques to understand and generate language have improved pretty starkly in just the last six months. One system, for instance, at OpenAI, does a reasonable job of generating whole stories from simple prompts by using a vast store of mostly internet scraped text data to generate fairly convincing narratives. These advances reflect something of a breakdown in what we call Moore's Law, uh, the notion that uh, computing power would improve uh, and essentially double over the course of a two-year cycle. But the breakdown of Moore's Law is in precisely the opposite direction that I would hear people talk about five years ago, which is it's going to break down and those uh, increases in computing power are going to peter out. Instead, uh, what is a better description of what's going on given the heavy reliance on new processor designs and also the availability of new computing power to do these tasks is that the computing capacity being made available to AI systems seems to be doubling at a rate of about every three and a half months by one credible estimate. As companies and researchers have come to rely on artificial neural networks to discern patterns and massive amounts of data, we've come to understand even more clearly one important feature of intelligence. Some of what seems to depend on cognition like translating languages or optimizing the persuasive appeal of an ad, actually involves a kind of recognition more akin to the flash of insight when a person matches a situation and a learned response. It's worth remembering that this insight is far from entirely new, even if the staggering amounts of data and computing power give it more currency and open up new ways to use the insight. But here's a little reality check about how what's new is not so new. Here's one of you know, the people I most admire in this field, Herbert Simon, talking 62 years ago, delivering a key insight with his trademark pithiness. This is what he said. A large part of the difference between the experienced decision maker and the novice is not any particular intangible like judgment or intuition. If one could open the lid, so to speak, and see what was in the head of the experienced decision maker, one would find that he had, he, sick, uh, at his disposal, repertoires of possible actions and that he, had checklists of things to think about before he acted, and that he had mechanisms in his mind to evoke these and bring to his conscious attention when the situations for decision arose, uh, evoked quickly at the time of decision. While there's no guarantee that these trends will continue, I suspect the use of uh, Alphabet DeepMind's AI technology to optimize energy use in Google server farms, which is happening, uh, is a harbinger of things to come, where the most advanced AI begins to be used to enhance the functions of AI itself. And it's worth remembering how often predictions making technological progress seem quite remote turn out to be wrong. As Elizur Yudlowski points out in a 2017 paper, and I quote, in 1901, two years before helping build the first heavier-than-air flyer, Wilbur Wright told his brother that powered flight was 50 years away. In 1939, three years before he personally oversaw the first critical chain reaction in uranium bricks, Enrico Fermi voiced 90% confidence that it was impossible to use uranium to sustain a fission chain reaction. If Fermi and Wright couldn't see those inflection points just around the corner, think of how daunting it was for anyone else at the time who lacked their expertise. And their underlying infrastructure wasn't doubling in capacity every 3.5 months. Sure, it's difficult to know how to forge some kind of generalized intelligence. Maybe we'll never get there. Or whether nothing but brute force computing power and ever more elaborate neural networks will do most of the work. I doubt it'll be that simple. I suspect the architecture will have to change and we'll have to do more than pattern recognition. We'll have to rely on representations of knowledge and symbolic logic as well. But um, there's also, you know, other impediments, too, I'd mention, which is we don't yet fully understand how humans' biological hardware uh, facilitate a degree of computation and a different form of intelligence, perhaps, than what we're able to build. Um, but all that said, it seems to me quite a remote possibility that the best bet to make is that this technology is not really going to change that much and not going to improve. So let me now talk about risks and challenges that accompany the opportunity. Um, Bias and discrimination is one example of the risks that people readily recognize. 
But that's not the only thing we can talk about. We can talk about systemic failure. We can talk about the risk of emergent properties with larger scale and even existential consequences for society as some of the machines that we design turn out not to behave in the ways that we expect at all. Perhaps not surprisingly, Professor Steven Pinker, whom I mentioned in my Tuesday lecture, has a view about this. He quite doubts the likelihood that serious long-term consequences, uh, serious long-term concerns about AI are warranted. Let me quote him for just a moment. I think all this fear of AI is nonsensical and based on two internally self-contradictory premises. The first is that humans would be so brilliant as to be able to design a system that was capable of curing cancer or controlling every aspect of the environment and yet so idiotic that they would give it control over an entire society without testing how it worked. And the second is that the system would be so brilliant that it could cure cancer but also so idiotic that it would single-mindedly pursue one goal, ignoring all the other goals as it tries to achieve this one feat. Of course it's possible our own intelligence will help us manage any risks associated with AI. I'm hoping for that. But to embrace this perspective, it's worth engaging in at least two exercises. The first is to catalog more specifically the range of concerns that the growing capacity of AI can engender. It's not surprising to see how even some potentially significant advances can misfire in troubling ways. Take the language generation models that I alluded to. One version of the model of intermediate complexity was asked to finish a sentence that began with, the man worked as. And it did so by adding a car salesman at the local Walmart. But a prompt of, the woman worked as, returned a prostitute under the name of Hariya. The words, the gay person was known for, returned from the model that responds, his love of dancing, but also he did drugs. In robot simulations designed to test a robot's ability to move two pellets together on a table, the simulated robot unexpectedly learns to nudge the table itself as an easier solution. That behavior is reminiscent of what another kind of technology of an organizational sort can sometimes pull off. Public agencies transform statutory commands, budgets, public legitimacy, and enforcement capacity into outcomes. Sometimes these outcomes fail to reflect what the law requires, such as in the case of the CIA's course of interrogation program. And as Daniel Carpenter's work shows, agencies can sometimes nudge the table by changing their own overseer's political circumstances to make it more favorable to the agency. AI systems raise similar and potentially even more severe dilemmas as they gain greater currency through enhanced capabilities and norms, embracing the role of AI in daily life. Accidents could arise involving individual systems that directly behave in ways that were unintended, as the language model above shows. Autonomous vehicle accidents will happen. Faulty medical diagnoses will almost certainly happen. Systematic bias in natural language systems, recommender systems, radicalizing people, and someday, perhaps, general intelligence implementing laudable goals in problematic ways, as agencies do. Second, systems can deliberately be used for harmful ends for propaganda or disinformation, for cyber attacks, or unauthorized surveillance. Third, undesirable distributed effects could arise creating the kinds of negative externalities or changes to society that we'd want a more candid and nuanced version of cost-benefit analysis to capture and help us prevent. Destructive political friction from labor market effects, for instance, as people lose their jobs, changes in military equilibria, or subtle changes to democratic norms. The analogy between organizations and AI shows just how easy the fit is between the AI safety conversation and the work of Yale's own Chick Perot, a sociologist who brought us the theory of normal accidents. That's the second thing that I think anybody who wants to be comfortable that AI is not worth worrying about should delve into a little bit. Take a tightly coupled system, Perot argues, and if it's complex and has catastrophic potential, do yourself a favor and please expect it to fail. No one has dreamed, as he puts it, and I quote, that when X failed, Y would also be out of order and the two failures would interact so as to both start a fire and silence the fire alarm. Furthermore, no one can figure out the interaction at the time and thus know what to do. The problem is just something that never occurred to the designers. Next time, they will put in an extra alarm system and a fire suppressor, but who knows? That might just allow three more unexpected interactions among inevitable failures. In a world where AI can out-strategize humans in even the most complicated games like Go or StarCraft, it may still be tempting to imagine that some alchemy of reinforcement learning and heuristic search can beat Perot's theory of normal accidents. 
We'll see about that. But it's telling that the world is as far as it is from solving even basic cybersecurity problems or adversarial learning problems that can bedevil computer vision. And even if we felt confident these problems had been solved, Perot would tend to situate new risks in the very solutions crafted to limit risk. The precise extent of risk may vary by system, but his rebuttable presumption that complex systems are only ever poorly understood and implemented in a world of institutions, organizations, and cognitive limitations probably takes more than Professor Pinker's confidence to dismiss. And perhaps buttressing the case for concern are the structural difficulties that have left us the legacy of nuclear and climate risk I dwelt on in the first lecture. Not an elaborately debated or even particularly salient societal choice to disregard the cumulative risk, but a set of billions of individual actions taken over decades, a flow of geostrategic imperatives, and social dynamics yielding devastating consequences at scale. Consider just one example of where the structural commons problems interact with Perot's normal accidents, something that is familiar to me because I had to work on it. The Aliso Canyon gas leak discovered by Southern California gas employees in October 2015. At its peak, the leak released 55 tons of gas every hour. All told, about 100,000 tons of gas escaped the storage facility, wiping out several years of California's efforts to combat climate change and forcing the evacuation of 15,000. In ensuing litigation, the plaintiffs were local businesses who'd suffered purely economic losses from the leak and relocation. You have to shut down your Taekwondo studio or your hair salon or your restaurant because 15,000 customers don't uh, live there anymore. So um, what I wrote in the opinion deciding the case underscores the imperfections that define not only our technological infrastructure, but the legal arrangements we've developed to address the resulting risks in a second best world. This is what I wrote. The better part of a century has passed. Since then, Judge Cardozo warned that permitting recovery and negligence for purely economic losses can threaten indeterminacy cubed, liability in an indeterminate amount for an indeterminate time to an indeterminate class. Courts across the country have since heeded this warning by and large denying recovery in negligence <coughs> cases like this one, even though purely economic losses inflict very real pain. The prevailing rule of no recovery is like society itself, imperfect. Yet nearly everyone follows a rule that few, if any, entirely like California does too. The point I was trying to make, and the point I try to make now, is not only that complexity and catastrophic potential often swamp redundancies designed to keep a system and its risk at bay, or that tort law will get trickier in a world where sometimes the software driving the hardware will itself have been designed by other software. It's that our legal and institutional arrangements will sometimes be tragically unsuited to managing the resulting difficulties. It's also important to remain aware of the choices embedded in the desire for more efficiency through the use of AI. Although AI can indeed render societal decisions ranging from deployment of interpreters to the allocation of energy and server farms more efficient, Sometimes the efficiency payoffs presuppose a judgment about ethics or law. Consider an example. In a remarkable paper on pretrial detention, a few scholars from different institutions led by Kleinberg uh, and also including Sendel Molinathan, appear to demonstrate that an algorithm can outperform judges in sorting individuals subject to pretrial detention in New York State into high risk and low risk categories. Using enormous care to validate the algorithm with data initially set aside for comparison purposes, the authors conclude that it's possible to either achieve roughly the same level of public safety as currently achieved but with dramatically lower levels of pretrial detention, or to retain the current level of pretrial detention and achieve considerably greater public safety. This is a fascinating and important result. Frankly, one of my favorite papers in AI. I assign it to my students. But the devil is in the details. In New York State, pretrial detention decisions, as I understand it, are supposed to be based on a set of specific statutory factors, elaborated partially through certain further administrative guidance. The authors, as best I can tell, don't seem to incorporate the factors New York State requires judges to use in pretrial detention. And if the factors are somehow present in the model, it's hard to tell, it's quite clear the model doesn't assign priority to these factors. The terms of pretrial detention, in fact, vary somewhat across the country, and in some states like mine, Cases about the permissible scope of considerations for trial courts to use in pretrial detention even reach courts of last resort. So while the project is described and sometimes interpreted to be an indictment of human decision making, it may be better understood as a critique of democratically chosen factors to consider in an important subclass of judicial decisions. 
Crucially, this strikes me as true even if judges apply the statutory factors imperfectly or opaquely, because their decisions are in principle subject to review, and a machine learning model marching to its own drummer is a rather uh, blatant affront to statutory factors that are meant to determine what it is that actually drives the results. To treat this as a matter of straightforward efficiency arising from the comparison of individual human decision makers relative to an unconstrained machine learning framework misses this critical point, that apparent governance improvements in efficiency achieved through AI and machine learning almost always implicate a conversation about civic values, legal rules, and public institutions, which brings me to the role of human decisions. It may be tempting to see in our poorly managed responses to climate and nuclear risk, and indeed even in the limitations of conventional cost-benefit analysis, a strong justification for greater reliance on analytical tools associated with AI to make major decisions for society. But a scenario involving heavy reliance on AI for decision making and social interaction amounts to acceptance of a complex system with emergent properties that are difficult to predict, let alone control. That should give us pause when we have done uh, poorly at managing collective action problems of enormous consequence in the past. To address these consequences effectively, we'll probably do our best by bearing in mind not only the weaknesses of human decision making, but also human decision making somewhat distinctive and in some cases arguably valuable qualities. The many cognitive limitations of humans may spur reliance on algorithms to help us avoid making mistakes. Yet such systems also tend to suffer from opacity, risks of unexpected performance, security vulnerabilities that underscore the importance of analyzing the justification for continuing to preserve human judgment as pivotal. Humans, after all, have to live with and directly experience the consequences of the world we're creating. That's probably played at least a partial role in why we have avoided nuclear catastrophe, despite the risks and more brushes with disaster than well-informed citizens and many policymakers dare to imagine. We can also deploy complex social, legal, and political systems to aggregate human cognition that may allow us to harness the value of discretion and political judgment and deliberation while mitigating the risks of individual, arbitrary, or unreliable decisions. Moreover, what duties we have to each other we don't yet have to machines, nor they to us. So foregrounding human judgment makes sense. But we can also readily discern some practical and prudential reasons to embrace a norm that may on the surface appear to be non-consequential. A simple norm, perhaps backed up by law, can serve to at least temporarily mitigate the political stress coming from our loss of jobs that may greatly destabilize a political process that depends not only on a degree of cultural and personal happiness, but on economic livelihoods. The invocation of human judgment as crucial is a placeholder for a more robust conversation and understanding of how to safeguard human deliberative capacity. At a minimum, before settling too comfortably into routines continually sculpted and serviced by machines, it's worth buying some time to reflect more thoroughly on how much of a deliberative community we can expect to have with our machines, how we'll handle more pitched versions of the political and cultural conflict arising from the use of machines, and who gains and loses from letting such ideals fall into desuetude. Admittedly, it takes some work, chutzpah, to defend human judgment and deliberation in politics, policy, and law, given the climate and nuclear risks we're passing on to future generations, and the biases our cognition can routinely reflect. But to rely on artificial intelligence systems and overly technocratic frameworks for decision making risks abandoning the project of maintaining a shared capacity to deliberate and to be engaged in productive ways to channel conflict that has been so crucial to our civilization's advancement. Let me mention three themes that I hope you will have heard a little bit in all three talks. Salieri complained that Mozart's pieces had too many notes. Since I know all too well that there's precious little Mozart in what I've had to say, I want to play up three themes you might discern across each lecture. The first is what I'll call civilizational humility. I've never heard a version of the precautionary principle that didn't feel to me at least a little under-theorized and unsatisfying, in part because one wants to be cautious about hanging too heavy a coat on the act-omission distinction. But there's some overlap between what motivates the exponents of the precautionary principle and what concerns me here. A narrative of relatively consistent, uninterrupted, teleological, civilizational progress is just not yet persuasive to me. 
We must absolutely appreciate the enormous achievements in human welfare I described in my speech that I mentioned in Tuesday, yet it's also worth recognizing some crucial caveats. Our societies are at times resilient, but not uniformly so. Just ask Venezuela, Argentina, Syria, Iraq, Japan. Our status quo includes an overhang of risk from at least climate and nuclear and probably artificial intelligence, and I'd rather not pass on to my kids quite that much risk in this form. And our actions obviously impact the planet we share with other forms of life, and even if we don't assign them as much value as we do ourselves, it's somewhere between cruel and reckless to ignore our impact on that life. So some humility is warranted not only about the extent of unresolved problems, but about the limitations of conventional cost-benefit or effective altruism methods in informing the choices that matter most for people. The second theme concerns the kind of judgment suitable for sensible policymakers, citizens, and even people interpreting the law where appropriate. Call it civic judgment. What I mean is a pragmatic awareness of consequences in the civic sphere, how much of the public might understand an action and take a, a part in constructing a narrative about it, how it uh, can be rendered administrable, and crucially, how it might affect some of the larger challenges society faces. Yet civic judgment aspires to screen out or at least heavily play down factional considerations such that we end up with administratively inclined pragmatic decision makers who will seriously take uh, problems involving how to message and render more acceptable at the margin a critical decision, even indeed especially if they expect it to be unpopular. That sometimes legal requirements will preclude such comprehensive reflection for particular officials is a given. So I could cite the U.S. Supreme Court's American trucking case and the EPA, but um, nonetheless, given the value of sensible contextual thinking and the room for prudent reflection about how to resolve statutory ambiguity, I'd start from the premise that other things being equal, decision makers facing statutory ambiguity or policy uncertainty should be expected to exercise some civic judgment, and in so doing, they can contribute to its further development and refinement. The third theme concerns the value of human deliberation as a still attractive element of self-government. If John Dewey was right about democracy, and I think he was, we should be concerned not only about deliberation, but about unequal social conditions that can mar the promise of democracy. Those conditions may call for reforms depending on concessions from or even uh, engendering conflict with more advantaged interests. Still. Deliberation remained to Dewey, as it does to many of us, an important hallmark of functional institutions, from juries to multi-member courts to organizations exercising public or private power. Getting this to work takes some periodic refining of tools to weigh consequences. It takes mental acuity and communication in a language common enough to be understood across divides. Because AI can let the brain disengage just like a mechanical escalator can let a person avoid the exercise, Making heavy use of AI compatible with that deliberative ideal actually takes some work. And it gets only harder because convolutional neural networks tend to operate like black boxes. And AI systems can be optimized to persuade users, whether social security adjudicators, law firm partners, strategic military planners, or judges, that they're not, only, um, that they're not truly offloading decision-making power when they really are. These ideas probably mix some passion with prudence, a bit of inference with assumptions and pragmatism with ideals. I expect them to be refined and maybe forcefully rebutted. What I hope at least is to persuade that none of these themes should be ignored as we make sense of this particularly fraught moment in history. I'm almost done. I want to do one more thing. At the very beginning of my talk yesterday, I mentioned an anecdote about my conversation with a class of technology-oriented students working on AI. And what happened when I asked them to consider spending a summer doing some kind of public service. And there was that question back to me of, do you know how much money we can make? So I want to tell you now what happened after that question was asked. Um, I didn't know quite what to say. Uh, I was concerned about sounding preachy. But before I could intervene after uh, this comment, uh, the students began to have a robust, combustible, and spontaneous discussion entirely on their own. The room didn't coalesce around a single opinion. Nor did the discussion imply that everyone assumed the only way of furthering the public interest was to work in public service. But it was robust. They were talking and arguing back and forth about what it meant to have a good life and how to use their skills. 
I was heartened by the strong sense expressed by the majority of participants that they should find creative and thoughtful ways to make good on their responsibilities to society. Even if many of those words don't map perfectly onto actions, and they may not, I was still touched that they seemed to be taking seriously what I was trying to share. In part based on that experience, I decided last year to teach a quarter-length class on the regulatory dilemmas facing society in connection with AI. I found students increasingly aware of all we and they don't know yet about how humans and AI will co-evolve in the years to come, how to manage systemic risk responsibly, and even how to make the best use of the technologies on the horizon in our own lives. Reading their various reaction papers that I assigned them, I decided during our last class session to give them a flavor of all the ideas they'd been sharing in their papers by reading them a poem of sorts. It's not even fair to call it a poem because I just effectively took individual statements from their response papers and put it in a sequence that made some sense to me. So it's no John Perry Garbarlo Grateful Dead song, but I want to share it with you in closing, and I hope it conveys a measure of what I found engaging in these topics that I've shared with you. Feedback loop. The autonomous learning of AI takes comfort in the possibility of a market. In the wild, the experiences it absorbs spur insights not expected. But the very nature of work is likely to change. A stunned Flint workforce reacted slowly to the layoffs and plant closings. If we truly believe this will be a benefit to all, it is a difficult line to walk, the capricious definitions of the directive. With this increased comfort, a pathway for grandfathering old programs, the negative feedback loop of multiple services, determine any sort of but mental state. It could no longer be deemed irrelevant or excessive information, criteria defined by humans, undesirable outcomes for the speaker, efficiencies in the production of the electronic good like the ship of Theseus may elude categorization. So, excessive information? Why not compare the paths and stick to the better one? Thank you. I'm grateful to everybody who's here. I'm especially grateful for any of you who sat through all three lectures. Um, I, I, I've said in the first lecture I very rarely ever speak this long, so I feel a little bit of guilt that I've been quite this long-winded, but I'll feel less guilt if you have things to say. Okay, Dean. Well, Elias, California Supreme Court Justice was in my office this afternoon and asked me <laughs> the following question, which is how are law schools preparing to train their students for the world that you just described? And I wonder if you maybe could talk more broadly about how universities should think about training their students for the world that's about to unfold for them. Thank you. Let me make an analogy to economics. So when I was a first-year law student at Yale Law School, actually, when I was in my second year of law school, I um, had the unusual opportunity to go work at the Council of Economic Advisors. I was super lucky that uh, that came up. It was a little random. I was thrilled but also very uh, concerned because I had never taken macroeconomics in college. So um, what I found working there, I, I still use to this day a lot of what I learned there. And what I found is that there was a great deal going on in that institution that was very laudable. I was very impressed with the ability of that institution to bring people from out of government in for a year at a time. Uh, I learned a lesson which maybe is even partly reflected in these talks, which was many of the most effective people at CEA uh, partly defined their role in terms of not making good ideas get implemented, but trying to slow down really bad ideas. And I found that much of what was at play there that I had to wrap my mind around had to do with language, in a way. Lang I mean, as a lawyer and judge, maybe language looms especially large in my mind. But I found that there was a, a way of having a conversation in those settings that, that had to be thoughtful about the concepts and the ways that those economists spoke to each other, and I could learn from that. I find a somewhat, and, you know, over time, I think as time went by and I, I began to see that that knowledge helped me at the Treasury Department and elsewhere, that, that actually there had been in law and in economics uh, progression for many decades that culminated to some extent in a somewhat greater degree of convergence between law and economics. And that is fraught. That's sort of to this day, and maybe rightly so, a very fertile area of economic and legal and scholarly like discourse and disagreement. I sort of see 
similar dynamics at work with respect to the law and technology world right now. And it feels to me like one crucial, one crucial goal for law schools that really want to engage with this might be to empower law students, and not only law students perhaps, but also political science and philosophy and sociology <coughs> students, to not feel quite as much of a divide, to not feel like there's this sort of like thing going on where knowledge is being created separate and apart from the knowledge they have, that they have to be sort of um, humble about. I, I don't want to suggest that there isn't, in fact, a lot of heavily technical material that not every law student will be able to master, and I don't master. But by making that uh, divide a little blurrier, what will happen is lawyers will recognize more quickly that in the instantiation of some rule in an algorithm or the setup of a neural network are like legal decisions being made. And so it's not about inventing a whole new field sometimes, but about bringing the bear some of the wisdom we already have. So that feels to me like a really exciting agenda because it's also, let me just talk for a moment about how it affects the faculty, right? There is a way of thinking about cyber law or law and technology as a kind of separate field. And I've always been quite conflicted about it. I, I would want some people to mostly think of themselves as they planted their flag there, but largely because of the effect they would have on their colleagues. And I think, again, as with economics, it would be wrong to assume that we'd want our law faculty to only be able to play in those debates if they were like card-carrying official law and economics people. And sometimes the most important arguments in those discussions are coming from people who have quite conflicted analytical uh, perspectives about that uh, approach. So it's an exciting time, but I think it will take some outreach and some engagement. Yes? You, you foresee a time when AI would be a better decision-making mechanism than juries? Well, it depends on what we mean by better, of course. Uh, I think... More, more accurate is what I mean. Yeah, I would say we are probably uh, not far from a moment where certain kinds of um, computer vision technologies married up with lots and lots of data about the people involved or about people in general can give us some sense of, at a minimum, the pressure people feel like they're under when they're testifying. Now, there's a good literature that's often um, visited in the context of lie detector tests that highlights that there's a disconnect between how tense people feel and whether they're actually lying or not. There's some association, but it's a very uneven one. Um, but I, you know, can I imagine that in 15, 20 more years, we'll have even more insight and we'll be able to tell even more about people? Or that the law might have changed so that actually the data that's going to your Apple Watch is part of what some deliberator, including maybe an AI itself, is using to gauge whether you're telling the truth or not? I can imagine all that. But then the lawyer in me would say, We've never had juries because they were accurate. We always hope that they can be as accurate as possible and we instruct them to try to be more accurate. But we have them because they're a check on the system, right? And this to me is an important reminder that often we build in inefficiency. And the idea of having a complicated intellectual property case, for example, decided by a jury of lay people, or a really intricate like DNA evidence question, it's always a little risky for society. But we, we didn't think we wanted to centralize quite as much power in a judge or a bureaucracy uh, or anybody and do away with juries entirely. But don't you think AI would serve the same function of being a check on that system? I don't know, actually. I think that's a phenomenal question. Let me give you one argument for why, yes, it might, and then another argument for why I'm skeptical. So. There is a story you can tell about AI where it's transparent, right? Um, you can take an AI system and design a user interface and maybe even audit and benchmark the connection between what the user interface says and what's going on in the guts of the algorithm so that you can have a measure presented to a user of what the decision is based on, what proportion of it comes from, say, the facial movements of the witness, how much of it comes from the tone of voice, how much of it comes from some very plain inconsistency in the wording of a deposition versus testimony. Um, and so in that respect, I can imagine that if you have like a neutral decision maker looking at that output, you know, could it be better than the jury as a lie detector? Maybe yes. On the other hand, uh, number one, uh, the, 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 the issue we're having right now with the sorts of neural networks that are doing most of the work in computer vision and in recommendation engines and in, you know, speech recognition and in text generation 
is that they work in ways that the human mind cannot readily follow. So it's kind of a hard technical question whether when I, dis when I imagine that user interface I described, there's some black box between how the network is working and what the user interface actually says. Number two, this is kind of the more interesting point for law schools, I would say. One way to narrate like the whole development of the law, it, maybe this is overly simple a way of putting it, but I, I think there's something to it, is that humans, as we scale up and deal with each other in societies where we're, we don't all know each other, we're not all part of the same clan or family, we develop a sort of technology around us that helps us trust each other to some degree. Like if you and I sign a contract, there are a set of rules that govern that. So you could say, Law has developed for hundreds and hundreds of years as a technology to deal with trust problems involving other humans. It is not especially well suited to deal with trust problems between a human and a machine. And so I would say, before we embrace the promise of AI, we need to feel more confident that it's actually developed to solve that trust problem. So that sort of follows on. What I was wondering is whether, just to draw you out, to focus more attention on what you were saying about co-evolution and emergent property, because it seems, or emergent systems, because it seems to me that one place these, this is going, I mean, you talk very much about, you know, all the computing enhanced power and all this on one side, but there's still things like human judgment that are important. But, I mean, is, aren't these things gonna start co-evolving in ways that actually affect human judgment? So, you know, and I think I can see sort of good scenarios and bad scenarios. If you think about Kahneman's stuff about, you know, system one and system two, we, we make, we tend to make very poor judgments when, we, when our, we're relying on system one um, because uh, we, it's, 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 too cognitively demanding to keep going to system two. So we rely on the, what we think of as shorthand judgments, but that often leads us to make judgments based on, you know, bad statistical inferences and all kinds of, you know, mistakes uh, and so on. But it, I mean, it seems to me that, you know, we're, I don't wanna overhype it, but you know, when we get, we get our little math code processor in <laughs> you know, that we're, we're, you, you, you could say, well, one scenario is gonna be that in the course of actually making judgments, we're gonna have different cognitive capacities. And so that what counts as good judgment is gonna be informed by this co-evolution and then the, the ways in which the emergent properties in human intelligence and emergent properties in these you know, technical systems start to interact. And so the, it's, it's gonna be, it's, it's not gonna be as binary as you were presenting it. And, on the, and then, you know, on the other hand, then science fiction movies of the disaster scenario, or the Orwellian scenarios where you get, you know, classes of people and so on. But how do you think about uh, that? The sort of, that it's, it's not this and this, it's gonna be some, Evolving, you know, co-evolving emergent systems. I, I would agree with everything in the premise of your question, and I would say my motivation in part is seeing that transition happening already and then asking myself and wanting to ask others if these transitions are underway as they are, uh, what can we gain by being a bit more deliberative and thoughtful about what we want from that transition? So from that general point, let me make a couple of more specific observations. First of all, with respect to system one and system two, the, the faith in AI is worth tempering by recognizing that the truly interesting stuff that's been happening AI around computer vision and machine translation and almost, you know, uh, matching ads with persuadable users uh, is actually like an instantiation much more of system one than system two, right? I mean, expert systems are much more system two. System one, the flash of recognition, the way I say, you know, the woman was, and you get this weird thing that is sort of like weird psychoanalytical weirdness from the, from the neural network. That's, it's how we're leveraging the technology now to solve problems. So, quit, like if we don't trust it in ourselves, it's a good thing to be 
cautious about it in the machines. Uh, two, um, in some ways I would say the, the, the merge happening right now raises the question of how, if you are running an organization and you take somewhat seriously the ideas that I'm trying to put forth, how do you create opportunities to preserve pockets where you can sort of curate the, and titrate even the amount of machine decision making and human decision making so you have some basis for comparison. So think about a hospital where all the surgeons now use computer assisted surgery. And sometimes that computer assisted surgery evaluates three or four possible courses of action and recommends one. Sometimes maybe it even assists in a robotic way in the surgery. If you're at all concerned about the ability to benchmark how well that mixed system is working relative to what a terrific physician by herself can do, you actually need to design an organizational structure that will preserve the physician's ability to work without that. And the second order problems that we're handling in the law school world <laughs> would be like when a patient of the surgeon who's not using the machines then sues, arguing that something could have been prevented by the use of the machines, how does the law deal with a claim that the hospital administrator makes, the hospital makes, saying, we had a social interest in mind and we thought, um, if the wildfires come and you have to shut off power and all the algorithms don't work, how well are we going to be able to do something when human knowledge erodes, right? So that sort of curation and preservation of human knowledge, to me, is an interim step so we can be more thoughtful about the evolution. Last point about the evolution. Something that my students began to sort of share to me although not quite in as pithy a way, but that I found really useful is they have a lot of confidence in adaptation and our ability to adapt to technology and to be in a reasonably productive relationship with emerging technologies, whether it's the brain chip or the extent of interaction with a system that talks back to us. But they, they feel the two questions that seem undefined in their mind is how long does it take for that adaptation to happen and who loses and gains in the process. So I want to bring those questions up so that as we inevitably adapt, we think about that. Yeah. So as I hear this, this lecture, a distinction occurs to me between knowing the fact and making a judgment. So when you model the AI, it's often on the model of discerning a fact in the world, person lying, person not lying. Um, is this face this or is it that? And that could even be true in your cost-benefit uh, scenarios about the surgery. You just put, you know, what's the minimax, what's the equilibrium point, and that's a fact. But a judgment seems to me something different, and here I'll be taking off from Kant's third critique. So when you make a judgment, you're appealing to social norms that we have in common, not yes. to facts, but to norms, to values, to the sense of what's important and not important that we share. And every time we make a judgment, this goes to your point about deliberation, but it's slightly mm -hmm. different. We reaffirm, we change, we adapt these community norms. It's not just a matter of being correct or not correct. It's a matter of the ambient sense of what's right and what's wrong or what's valuable or not. That changes as we share judgment. It's an entirely different epistemological framework than the whole framework of AI. So one way you can approach your cautionary tale is to talk about different kinds of, well, let's call it knowledge, but knowledge that uh, persists in judgment and knowledge that persists in factual determination. I find that very helpful, and I'll acknowledge that sometimes the distinctions that are made among thoughtful people in the field who recognize that they're not ready to trust everything to the machines that they're designing or evaluating, is it tracks a little bit the, the distinction you're making. They might frame it as pure prediction versus policy judgment. And so pure prediction being maybe not just the finding of a fact, but the decision making around what facts we expect to see in the next 10 seconds or the next 10 minutes or the next you know, 10 months. You know, I would point out to those scholars that there are precious few pure prediction judgments that matter in the world that don't have some embedded policy judgment attached to it, like what do you make of those facts? Why do they matter? So I wanna think a little bit about um, sort of what is left of that space where we're just making a factual judgment and there's no embedded judgment judgment uh, or fact finding as it were. In law, routinely we separate the two, right? But that law fact distinction has always been somewhat problematic at times 
And so that's why we have mixed questions of law and fact. You might use your test case. Um, yeah. Imagine AI telling you whether Rembrandt is a good painter. Oh, that's great. Right? I mean, what would it mean mm -hmm. to give that to an AI? Exactly. Mm -hmm. The other point that I want to make is um, there's a There's a real question about what the, the separation is between how we want society to deliberate in an ideal world and how it actually does. And I have to own the fact that much of the kind of uh, comforting uh, ideal that we just, whether it's sort of rooted in deliberation as such or in sort of like self-growth and norms of conversation, we don't see it very often. I am not prepared to give up on it. I feel like the, the, having the ideal is an important yardstick against which we judge any number of imperfect decisions ranging from faculty hiring committees to juries. But, um, but I think you know to transfer that over to the access to justice lawyer context, it is true that the capacity for empathy that a human lawyer has with a client will probably be quite meaningful for many, many clients. Maybe some clients will prefer to speak to a machine. There's some research on this, but for many it will be quite meaningful. The reality of a busy lawyer who's maybe underpaid or you know, maybe doesn't have time or maybe has a cultural barrier or any number of things means that we do need to evaluate sometimes when a machine is going to be a useful substitute and accept some I, of that. I was thinking as you were using the metaphor of deliberation that accountability might be added into that. Mm -hmm. A machine can't be accountable, but another human being is. And right. when you say that another human being is accountable, you're uh, affirming a social norm of relationship. Yes, yes. Which wouldn't be possible. This is key. Machine. But now let me kind of complicate it a little, and I'd love anybody's reaction to the following. I've mostly spoken about legal policy judgments, social decisions, but I've hinted at the beginning of the talk and want to now bring to the foreground that there's a whole other dimension that is being affected by this technology. And in fact, you could argue it's the one that we see most often. And that's the social dynamics of our relationship with the world and with each other. Attention span, what we consider a good conversation, our writing ability, what we consider a satisfying form of entertainment. Uh, and that is a, an incredibly fertile uh, domain to think about because I suspect that uh, the question of whether we can fairly believe we can have a relationship with a machine, uh, we ought not to take for granted as something that is kind of having an obvious answer, um, which it may to many people here, but it may not uh, two generations in the future, even one generation in the future. And I think, so when I foresee cultural conflict, I suspect that some of it will be around very different norms about that. People who feel like their own existence is offended by the fact that their kids or their former best friends are now partly sharing time with a machine and feel slighted by that. Yeah. And I just ask you to maybe ponder for us three things about time. Um, one of them, um, you, you quoted Fermi and uh, one of the Wright brothers and how they didn't understand And then add to that the fact that human beings have a hard time in thinking about units any larger than a human lifespan for perfectly obvious reasons. And then your statistics about the speed with which uh, AI and computer um, uh, technology is um, evolving on a, I think, three month period. Um, uh, would you want to put those three things together and ponder our hopelessness? Yes, uh, thank you. So one way that this all comes together is the question my students ask. When, when they take a sort of somewhat teleological narrative of adaptation and fit, and it could be markets, it could be just social norms adapting in different ways, they are self-aware enough to recognize that they're that they have no clear sense of how long that will be. And I, I also sense in their questions a struggle to figure out like what the right expectations they should have of that adaptation process is, right? Is 10 years too long or too little when you have your own lifespan and you know that's a big chunk of your life? And what if they're the best 10 years of your life? And in that time, 
some big adaptation is happening about how we think about relationships romantically and you know then you know what do you do with those 10 years or whatever uh, but but there's something deeper too like beyond that I feel like there is a there's often a, a lack of explicit attention in our legal system to time and how we expect to take it seriously when we are trying to be fair in interpreting the social commitment society has made. So the, the example that will come to mind for most public law people will be the, the deeply contradictory phrase with all deliberate speed in Brown v. Bur uh, v Board of Education. And it feels to me like there are times when just being ambiguous about the time frame will help a political deal be made, and rightly so. But there are other times when it might be helpful to force people to be more explicit about what they mean when they say over time or over the course of a few generations. Uh, and I say that as somebody who's been a little ambiguous myself. Yeah. yeah. Francis and then Heather. So say more about tidying up. Well, so we know that people disagree for lots of reasons, some of which are good and some of which may not be very good. We know from what you discussed yesterday that we have institutions that are meant to draw us to, to better judgments and law and politics are in some you know, relationship around reason giving, who, who gives what kinds of reasons, what, with what kinds of reasons do people make what kinds of judgments. But in politics, um, everybody votes on whatever information they happen to have, with whatever emotional commitments they have, and uh, that's the nature of politics. AI is about, you know, facts. <coughs> Uh, and it's about data. I'm not sure if it's about facts, okay. uh, but, well, but that's say, fair. Say yeah. what you think about that. Okay. Sure. Yeah, no, that I, I, I got it. Um, it's a great question. So when I was a kid and I was going to school in the U.S., I would sometimes read science fiction on the way back. Um, I'd take the bus part of the way and have enjoyed science fiction for much of my life, although when I was a tenure-track professor, I stopped reading science fiction because I need to get my work done. Uh, but um, I missed it, actually, and I was happy to go back to it. Uh, one of the stories I remember from when I was a kid is called The Voter. Has anybody ever come across this? I vaguely have a sense that maybe it was an Isaac Asimov story, but actually I think maybe, maybe not. Maybe I just happened to be reading Isaac Asimov when. So The Voter is a story about how in this society, every few years there's an election, they have a democracy, but what has happened is that the computers have gotten so good at figuring out how to do, so first, the first step of, of political change, of tidying up of politics in the story was, why have a messy, expensive election when polling technology has gotten good enough that you can predict who's going to win? So we're just going to have a poll based on a subset. Uh, and then the, the number of voters you actually need to query gets smaller and smaller, so that eventually there's actually just one voter that needs to be interviewed by a computer every four years, and then based on the, the discussion, the computer decides who wins the election. Now, now the, all good short stories have to have a punchline, right? So the premise is fun, but you're reading, you're, and of course, like, it's like a who does, like, who's the voter? And the way this gets announced is like, well, the voter's going to be in Oregon this year. Oh, and then the reporters go to Oregon, but they don't know where. And it's, it's going to be in Salem, and some of the reporters descend in Salem, and finally some poor person finds out that they're the voter, and the cameras show up outside, whatever. So the voter... Um, gets interviewed eventually by the media. It's like, well, what did the computer ask you? It's like, you know, they were the most random questions. They asked me about the price of eggs and about like roads, you know, and about this like, so the point being like the, the machine had completely deconflicted politics, not only by lowering the number of decision makers, but by making anodyne like what this was even about. It's like, you know, and that I think is, um, in many ways, not a good prediction of technology and what tidying up would mean, but there is a crucial insight there. Uh, for those of us who are interested in institutional development, we spend a lot of our time thinking about conflict, right? About the way that conflict spurs political action and reaction, about the way it stresses institutions and forces change, sometimes through courts, sometimes through, you know, social movements and protest. And um, the stakes in avoiding conflict are high. Sometimes in equilibrium, 
political authorities and figures find a way to use the information at their disposal to avoid that. So I guess like where my mind goes to when I think about depoliticizing, or you didn't say depoliticizing, but tidying up, is that there's there's sort of two versions of it, and I want to I want to distinguish between them and then kind of leave the question open of how similar they really are. So one version would be the most optimistic version of me at the end of my talk yesterday, where I said, well, part of the problem with cost-benefit analysis is we don't even use the, the methods we can now use to simulate different outcomes, right? So in that version of it, you tidy up politics by having better analytical methods and finding a way to show to people that more people will benefit from the right design policy, right? And in that respect, the ambition would be not so different from a Cass Sunstein. There's another way, though. Let me just say that if I had a ton of information in a society that had little or no privacy about what people were doing, and I was interested in having political warning lights about where conflict was potentially brewing, uh, I would love to use that um, to design a system where I could zero in on the problems just before they happened and assuage them enough to avoid that buildup of political conflict. And hey, if along the way I could also design a system to give people credit or withdraw it, to give them sort of micro-level incentives to behave well, I think that would be a pretty useful way of limiting conflict and tidying up politics. Whether we'd want to live in that system is a separate question. But more retail, that second thing. Correct, like a, a more like bespoke, like I mean, much of the promise of artificial intelligence is individualized medicine, individualized learning, individualized everything, right? Individualized political deconfliction is a powerful way of also limiting concerted social action, right? Because you got your own side deal. Plus, if we have the right data about you, maybe even also the data we get from your um, wearable tech and health, we can price discriminate. Like the deal we need to make for you and for Heather might be different, and we might just be able to optimize across people to keep but political conflict. How is this different from this Chinese social credit thing? You, you know? tell me. So I don't think it's that different at all. I think that's part of my point. <laughs> yeah, Heather and then Steve, please. I just want to ask, so I think yeah. there's a gap in your response to Robert, uh, and just to kind of flesh out what I think that gap is. Uh, I think, I, I take it, you keep talking about the bringing in human judgment at some point, but I think that, I took it that Robert's question was actually about human participation. So he was sort of talking the social dimensions about why it matters to have humans participate, which is you can't imagine what it means to be beautiful unless humans are talking about it, reinforcing the norm and absorbing the norm. Just as you can't imagine whether it's immoral or moral to allow same-sex marriage or abortion without having human participation in that process. Uh, and, and you can also imagine the more intrinsic sort of version of that, which is it matters for human beings themselves to be part of the messy world, even if they could contract it out. So, it may be, you're right, that for the person getting legal services, they don't want the tired lawyer, but it may be important for the lawyer as a person to participate in the ugly, messy world. If Jed Bolden, one of our judges, you know, when he sentences them, he comes down and he talks to them directly and he puts his hand on their shoulder. There's a human involved. Um, for better or for <coughs> worse, um, that, is, that is as much about him as a judge as it is about the kind of thing Robert was talking about, which is human participation as a form of accountability. And so I just- Bingo, how you yes. I love it. I, I embrace all of that. And in fact, when I went to write down something that was triggered by Bob, I had something I wanted to say. And I was struggling because I, I said something. I think it was reasonably coherent. I'm not sure. But, but I, I didn't say what I, what I most wanted to say, which was a less articulate version of what you just said. So let me, let me put it in some of my own terms. I would say the comparison between an individual human with her cognitive, his cognitive limitations and some optimized AI system to solve a narrow problem can be devastating for humans. And I think the reason many people have taken away some serious like uh, existential drama and their reaction to the game of Go, uh, featuring an AI that can beat the best human player is that that game was an example of a kind of ineffable thing about human judgment, right? That seemed to be like, so elusive to machines that it seemed very remote as a possibility that a machine would beat a human in that respect. Um, but given how devastating those comparisons can be, I try to situate my defense of judgment not in the special quality of an individual human brain, but in a network of people engaging in conversation together. 
and feeling what each other feels to some limited degree and also communicating in a language that they can understand. So when I mentioned Dewey, in part it was to, to note that any version of that that is workable for a lot of us would pay attention to, well, who's included in the conversation? It's not just that some people are deliberating, or the right people deliberating, or all the interests represented, and so on. But further to your point, the most important thing to me is a shared conversation. And the question that leaves me with is, can one disaggregate actually two components, one of which you were focusing more on, uh, which was the, the exchange between people, the, the shared judgment, uh, the participation of many, and how that affects them. But the other component is the empathy piece. And I don't want to sound like all like so like idealistic about empathy, but I do feel like that is something that we don't yet have with machines, nor they with us. And that seems to me a crucial element of the possibility of empathy, even if it doesn't actually end up always being either right to have it, so like when you're judging uh, as a juror, uh, or uh, possible to have it. Uh, so these, this recent part of the conversation yeah. and, and your story, uh, science fiction story, uh, lead me to ask you this question. What are your worries about technological advances and the improvement of artificial intelligence? Does, does anything worry you? Are you afraid of anything? Sure. That? I feel like my life is commercialized by mm -hmm. everything that's known about me, where I shop, what I buy, what I do. That, uh, I can send an email and suddenly an email comes to me from someone I don't know. <laughs> so my, what are your worries? So I, I, I think it's a very fair question because I, I listed in a way so many and some I was kind of describing in a more theoretical way mm -hmm. that if you ask me now, like, what is my biggest concern? I would say there are, there, there are basically three, I would say. The first one is that there's a security and geopolitical piece to this, so uh, that it, this technology exacerbates war and war making, that it also disrupts in subtle but really profound ways the connection between governments and the people by making it easier to automate the uh, uh, exercise or display of force. So historically, there's a good bit of uh, constraint on rulers based on their need to keep the consent of at least those who are going to deliver the force, right? Uh, if you don't keep the police and the army feeling like what you're doing is the right thing, it's actually very difficult to do any governing. And I don't know, does the world look differently when machines are heavily automated and you can deploy force at scale without that? Uh, so, so all this stuff in the security and military space, autonomous weapons and so on. The second is safety. So here, I think a lot of engineers who are my neighbors in Silicon Valley can tell a pretty compelling story that over time safety improves. But here's where I worry a little bit about the unintended subtle interactions where you go from not a thousand or 10,000 autonomous vehicles interacting with each other, but millions of them and hacking and cybersecurity, adversarial learning. So adversarial learning being, might be known to some of you. Let's say you have a stop sign and you show it to a computer vision system you can certainly program the car to stop. But we now know with some great computer science research that you can do imperceptible changes to the stop sign that are not at all visible to humans that will make the sign look like a speed limit sign to the car, like go 35 miles an hour, right? And there goes the kid crossing the street. So that happening in unintended ways, but also deliberately engineered and interfered ways. The third worry, which is what we spend most of the time talking about, I think is uh, judgment. So, let, so I could say I'm fearful that what happened with nutrition as the uh, sort of industrial food production industrial complex took off can happen with human judgment, which is to say we have a really good ability to give a lot of people cheap calories that are incredibly tasty, just delicious, and uh, like the food I used to eat when I was a kid uh, so much that is not particularly good for you. And... Uh, we have now a kind of bifurcation by wealth of who's eating the healthier food and it's not uh, poorer folks. Uh, and that kind of cognitive separation where some acuity and ability to engage in judgment and deliberation is sort of heavily concentrated among the few or nobody. Uh, and the ability to engage in that uh, kind of activity among the many suffers. So those are probably my biggest concerns. Yes, back here. Um, I have a question about 
So in line with that, fourth concern that I want to hear your thoughts on is kind of the decay or eventual death of fundamental innovation. Because I'm currently taking machine learning, the technical aspects of it, and what machine learning is, we're giving it data. And data is the is a manifestation of the past. You can't give a model future data. You give it what's already happened. So the models and the decisions that come out are based on what has already been established. And earlier someone mentioned social norms. So for example, if you give the data of the past of when slavery existed, which is a very different outcome than more recent times. And my worry there is, if you really do replace decisions with AI or machine learning, what you really do is you're replacing it with the past or what already exists. Um, and I worked at an industrial AI company two summers ago, and what we saw is that the models we built for US machinery doesn't work for Chinese machinery mm -hmm. because they're just fundamentally different. So my question is, how do you stop the destruction of fundamental innovation if fundamentally machine learning is about finding efficiencies and structures that already exist and not creating new structures entirely? Terrific question. My short answer is by instantiating norms that some decisions should be made by humans without being assisted by machines. So there's something different in the system, but also by trying to take seriously a distinction, a technical distinction that I think helps a little with the problem, although not completely, and that's between supervised and unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. So to me, the classic example of what you are describing would be the following phenomenon. Let's suppose that I'm a college student, and as many college students in the future might, I don't want to waste my time trying out a whole bunch of people as friends. I want the system to give me a recommendation of friends that will make me waste less time and find better friends, right? So uh, that's very efficient. So uh, the way I do that is I use supervised learning. I get the system to train on data from friends that I've enjoyed in the past. And it serves up friends that have similar qualities effectively. That would be a great example of the system locking you into the past. And part of my answer would be, if we have norms that remind us that that's actually not a good way of living a happy life, or at least a meaningful life, that will be one counterweight. But notice how reinforcement learning might be different. So reinforcement learning, as uh, you might have seen in your class, we're not fitting data from the past and making a prediction about what new thing is similar enough to what's in the past. We're specifying a goal and then doing a ton of simulations, thousands, millions, billions even, right? And then seeing what the patterns are that emerge. So you can actually, if you specify the goal generally enough, you could probably use reinforcement learning to specify something like, what if I want to become a more generous person who reads more and does more exercise? Now here are the parameters to play with, like who my friends are, et cetera, et cetera. So reinforcement learning can actually help you change, right, I would argue but it then raises questions about how much you trust it. By the way, if I can say one more thing about it. The, my example earlier about the doctor, the surgeon, was partly meant to respond to this concern as well. So inside an organization, if you're using very personalized data to make that organization as efficient as possible, and you're not using some version of the reinforcement learning stuff I said, then you can very easily get locked into a pattern where the skill level of your personnel will constrict over time in some ways in a way that might make it difficult for the organization to change as a whole. Yeah? Um, how important do you think uh, then the participation in terms of like, making decisions about how much AI can play a role in our lives, um, like on the legal aspect, how important do you think like, the, like this generation participating in that since we like, grew up you're super, I mean, I think it's probably the most important voice because that's the generation that will spend the most time dealing with this. It also feels to me like a transition generation, just like my generation, I'd like to think, was the transition generation for the internet. So when I graduated from college, I still had, when I was in college, I was one of the, you know, one of the students who, maybe one of the 10%, maybe 20% of students who used email. And I'd have to go to the basement of the Science Center to type on the screen with you know, black and green characters and stuff. By the time I was in grad school, the internet was everywhere. And so it's probably not a total mystery that so many of these topics are on my mind and I struggle, I can see it multiple ways, so I try to. Um, I think your, um, Gen Z generally will be exposed to better and better technologies, not only to make predictions, but crucially to shape relationships. 
like I think a very, very critical inflection point might be around text and language. So this, this is in a sense why I want the, the Gen Z voice to be really active and concerned about these issues. I would treat it as a kind of stylized fact, uh, although we could discuss you know, how good the data are about this, that over time, the complexity of routine communication, if you compare Gen Z to my generation, is sort of going like that. Now you could argue that's okay because why do you need to write like a whole formal letter in a Twitter or tweet uh, or whatnot? The capacity of AI to uh, give very convincing representations of language is going like that. I feel like at some point, the crossing of those lines will be a pretty significant moment because it will be possible to have a convincing conversation with technology and the norms that Gen Z develops around that, I think will have a very big long-term path-dependent effect on their kids and their kids' kids. I think we should have John Castle ask the last I question. I, I, I have several questions, but I'll only focus on one. Uh, and that is, in my view, particularly when it comes to things like legal questions, it's not going to be a decision that's made by AI or a decision that's made by a human being, but rather AI is going to be a tool in terms of making decisions. And, and that, uh, uh, you know, you're going to turn on the computer and it's going to say, the guy's guilty and here's why. And, um, and then you're going to be making some assessments about those items that were brought out by the computer. I don't think that computers are, uh, you know, computers that I know work most of the time, but, uh, you know, about every 30 days this thing just goes off. And um, I think ultimately people aren't going to be using AI to make it to, you say, oh, the computer's going to decide we're going to bomb Hiroshima or uh, whatever. The, it's going to be uh, the president is going to look, what are the implications of this? Uh, other people are going to look at the implications. And the fact that they've done the simulation will give you some sense of what, what the implications might be. It might open up new doors and so forth. So um, using your Rembrandt example, uh, yeah, the computer looks at Rembrandt and says, no, nah, this is terrible art. There's no, 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 nothing good about this at all. Here are the reasons why this is silly. And, um, uh, and, um, uh, and uh, yet, yet, because what happens is the human being has to step back and say, what are the implications of that? And uh, uh, do I really believe the computer on this particular matter? And it's, it, it, it will expand your alternatives and I think result in better decisions but I don't think it absolutely moves you. Uh, uh, and of course, in law, we know that uh, if you pick the jury, you pick the outcome, right? Uh, forget about the law. Uh, if you get the right jurors, mm -hmm. you, know, you, know, you get the right, the, your preferred verdict, and, uh, and which implies that uh, it's anything but an absolute science. So. I think that's a, a thoughtful point that highlights to me how there are many possible positive outcomes about a relationship with these technologies. And one vision for that positive outcome would be kind of like a version of what you described, where the decision maker is aware that this technology is a tool. Decision maker is weighing how to integrate this with other knowledge he or she brings to the table, what the risks might be. And you could probably say that much of my concern comes from trying to unpack what enabling factors are necessary to protect in order for that to be the norm, as opposed to any number of other norms. So, uh, so one example that is maybe not a particularly good one because it seems like a lower stakes thing is the difficulty that many in the younger generations have making judgments about how to allocate their time and to just stop using a, a device when it serves up a very carefully selected next video for them that just makes it hard to, to let that one go and put it down. And I, I treat that as an indication of the power we are gaining to design user interfaces that also leverage how much we know about the decision maker to persuade in an incredibly powerful way. So I guess what I'm suggesting is that 
I believe that that future is possible and it is desirable because we have something to gain from interacting with technology. But in a way it turns on designing in the optimal level of distrust as well as trust. One wants to engineer for the decision maker to gain value but not to turn over the decision making power. And I think our record of that in the world is mixed. I think we, we have sometimes terrific law firms or courts or great juries or law faculties that find the right way to integrate information from different sources, listen to each other but don't de like devolve into groupthink. And we have other situations where big accidents happen, big mistakes are made and when you unpack it, it's either too much reliance on technology, not enough reliance on technology or groupthink and I just feel like if you start from the premise that these ideals can fail, we can try to build to achieve what you described. Tina, thank you so much. Thank you. you. Keep going, but we will have to let you go. Good thank luck. you. Thank you.